The new section is entitled Random Variables. Random variables are generally denoted by capital X or capital Y. And random variables, they count things. Random variables, they count things. For example, toss a coin ten times, which, by the way, is the same as tossing ten coins once. Toss a coin ten times. Let X be the random variable that counts the number of heads. Okay, if you toss 10 coins, how many heads it might come up? X can be one of these numbers. It can either be zero, meaning that you toss the coin 10 times and zero heads came up. Or one head came up, or two heads came up, or three, or four, or five, or six, or seven heads out of the ten came up. Or out of the ten you had eight heads, or nine heads, or you had ten heads. Random variables counts. In this case, it counts the number of heads. Roll or die. 25 times. Let the random variable, variable be the number of fives. Let the random variable x be the number of fives. So the values that x can take on, well, if you toss a coin 25 times, you could have gotten zero fives. Could have been everything but a five. Or only one of them could be a five. Or maybe only one or two of them were a five. Or three. Or all the way up to 14 are fives. Or maybe you have 15 fives. All the way up to 24 of the tosses or rolls were a five. Or amazingly, Maybe all 25 rolls ended up being a 5. But nonetheless, those are the values that the random variable can be. The random variable, in this case, counts the number of 5s. It counts things. You take a test, it, the random variable could be the number of questions you got right. It could be the number of questions you got wrong. In this last problem, where we talked about rolling a die 25 times, you could allow the random variable, let the random variable be the number of even tosses. That is, we're going to count the times either two, four, or six come up. Can even say, let the random variable be the number of three, five, and sixes. However you define it, but whatever the random variable counts, let the random variable x be the number of times three, five, or six come up. So a random variable counts things. If you have three children, you can let the random variable be the number of boys. Okay. Toss a coin five times. Let's make it three times. Toss a coin three times. Let the random variable big X count the number 
uh, times 6 comes up. 6 comes up. Well, the num if you toss a coin three times, or if you toss three, excuse me, oh, uh, uh, all right, I, I meant to use a die, I'm sorry, toss a, toss a coin three times, let the random variable count the number of heads that come up. Okay, we're going to count the number of times that a head comes up. Well, you can have either zero heads, or maybe one head came up, or two heads came up, or all three tosses resulted in a head. Now, there's something called a probability distribution. Probability distribution. The probability distribution tells you the probability for each one of these cases, getting zero heads or one head or two heads. Now on the right here, I'll write out the sample space. You can get head two times first. Uh, you can have head, 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 actually four times. What am I saying? You can have head tail on the last two. You can have tail head or tail tail. That is, you can have head on the first, head on the second, and possibly head on the third. Or you can have head on the first, head on the second, third toss of the head. You can have those four. Or you could have had tail on the first toss. And the remaining two results will be as follows. Okay, so there are eight possibilities, and they're all equally likely. If you want to make up a probability distribution table, it will have x, and it will have the probability of x. Like I said, a probability distribution gives you the probabilities for each of the values that x can be, 0, 1, 2, or 3. x is 0. Now remember, x counts the number of heads. There is only one time out of the eight where you got no heads. One head. Well, this one has one head, this one has one head, and this one has one head. Three times out of eight. Now, if you think about it in an intelligent way, you can have figured out that it was three without even counting. Because if you're going to have one head, Either that head is in the first position and tails elsewhere, or the head is in the second position and tails elsewhere, because I only want to have one head, or the head in the third position and tails in the other two positions. And as you can see, there's three of them. Now, if you want to be clever in the next case where x is 2, that means two heads. Well, if you think about it, if you're going to have two heads and you're tossing a coin three times, you must have gotten one tail. Either you had the one tail in the first position or the one tail in the second position or the one tail in the third position. Again, there's three possibilities. Or you have all three heads. Well, there's only one way that can happen. This way, head, head, head. So that's one over eight. And right here is your probability distribution table. For each of the values that the random variable x can take on, namely 0, 1, 2, and 3, I listed their probabilities. So when x is 0, it's the probability of tossing a coin three times and getting 0 heads. 1 out of 8. Try another one. Okay, how about this time we really roll a coin? 
Well, you, excuse me, roll a die. Roll a die five times. Actually, again, that's too many. Let's just say four times, which is a lot. Roll a, okay, roll a die four times. Let the random variable x count the number of fives. Okay, well, if you toss a coin four times, the number of fives that can come up is either 0, 1, 2, or 3. Now we want the probability of x. So we have fives and not fives. So if you want, so you want not five. You want not five, not five, all four times. The chances of getting not five, well, there's six outcomes Five of them are not five, namely one, two, three, four, and six. So the probability of the first one is not a five, it's five over six. The second one is five over six. The third one is five over six. The fourth one is five over six. In fact, it's going to be five, six to the fourth power. The next one. This is a good problem to do because it will help us out in the next section, which is binarial, binomial problems. We want to get one five in four slashes. Something's wrong with that last one. For some reason, I don't like this last answer. Well, there's six outcomes for the first, six for the second, six for the third, six to the fourth. There are six to the fourth possibilities. Of these six to the fourth possibilities, how many of them have exactly zero fives? Yeah, I guess we did do it right. And the answer is there's five choices for the first one, either one, two, three, four, or six, and five for the second, five for the third, five to the fourth. This is five to the fourth. So I was correct. Remember, if the powers are the same and you're dividing, you can just divide the numbers first and then raise it to that common power. Okay, now the second one. We know that there are six to the fourth possible outcomes. How many of these outcomes have one five? Well, if the five is in the first position and the other ones are not five, well, we know there are six to the fourth possibilities. How many of them are of this type? A five and not a five? Well, there's one way of getting a five, just five. There are coincidentally five ways of not getting a five. One, two, three, four, or six and five ways of not getting a five, and five ways of not getting a five. When you multiply those, get five cubed. I'm going to do the last one next. Three fives. Oh, if you're tossing a coin four times, you might actually get four heads. Excuse me, four fives. So, what if we want two fives? Well, suppose they're in the first position, first two position. So 
stuff. There's only one way of getting, of picking, there's one choice to pick from for the first position, it has to be a five. The second position, there's only one value to pick, it must be a five. For the third position, it's not a five. So you can pick from any of the remaining five values. And then not a five, you can pick from one of the five. This is 25, which, by the way, is 5 squared. Now, the thing is, is we didn't have to, to get two fives. They don't have to be in the first two positions. They can be in the third and fourth position, and elsewhere is not 5. Or they, it can be in the first and the third position. Or it can be in the last two positions. No matter what, you're going to be able to get 25 different cases for each of these. For example, you could have 1, 1, 1, 5, 5, 3. Notice the first and the last position was not 5. Or you can have 1, 5, 5, 4. Or you can have 3, 5, 5, 6. Or 6, 5, 5, 2. There's many different ways. There's 25. And this is true for every scenario where we will have exactly two fives. Well, basically, you have four positions and you want to choose two to be a five. And this can be done, well, this number goes on top factorial this number goes in the bottom factorial. The difference, 4 minus 2, which is 2, goes factorial on the bottom. 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2, which is 24. 2 factorial is 2 times another 2 is 4. So you get 6. There are six different ways of writing down two fives and two other numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, or 6. So we need to multiply these. 25 times 6 is 300. Now let's do the last one next. Let's do the last one next. There's a reason I'm going to do the last one next. The reason is because this column of numbers must add up to 1. And if I know 1, 2, 3, 4 of the 5 results, I can figure out the last one. I can figure out this number. Okay, so we want all 4 to be 5. Well, we know there's 6 to the 4 ways of tossing 4 coins. And... How many of them are favorable? How many of them have four fives? Well, there's only one way of rolling four fives. You roll a five on the first, a five on the second, a five on the third, and a five on the fourth. Now, these numbers, these five numbers in the right column, must add up to one. So, you have five to the fourth over six to the fourth plus 5 cubed over 6 to the 4th, plus 300 over 6 to the 4th, plus an unknown, equals 1. And I don't know why none of that came out. 5 to the 4th over 6 to the 4th, plus 5 cubed over 6 to the 4th. I'm just adding up those numbers. Plus 300 over 6 to the 4th plus an unknown, call it x, equals 1. Now 6 to the 4th is 6 times 6 times 6 times 6. Well, I know that's 36 and that's 36. What I don't know is what 36 times 36 is. I know that 6 times 36 is 216. And 3 times 36 I know is 108. So the answer is 1296. So the common bottom for these three numbers is 1296 plus the unknown 
is 1. Well, what's the numerator? Okay, 5 to the 4th. 5 times 5 times 5 times 5. 25 times 25. You should know that. 625 plus 5 cubed. 5 times 5 is 25. 25 times 5 is like 5 quarters. It's 125 plus 300. We already knew that was 300. Okay, well, we add those numerators and we get what we get. We add them 750. We get 1050 over 1296 plus some number gives us 1. Well, the number is going to have the same denominator. And a fraction is 1 you know, if it's 1296 over 1296. Well, this number plus what gives you 1296? Well, let's see. 1050 plus what number gives you 1296? Well, 0 plus 6 gives me 6. 5 plus 4 gives me 9. 0 plus 2 gives me 2, and 1 plus a 0 gives me 1. So the answer is 246. Okay. 246 over 64. 6 to the 4th, excuse me. In my opinion, it was a lot easier to do this subtraction or addition, however you want to think of it, to figure out the missing number. They always should add up to 1. And if they're not, possibly you don't have all, or cur all the values for x, or possibly you found the wrong probability. The only thing is doing it the way that I just did it, you won't catch an error because you're making it add up to 1. We made it add up to 1. You're like, sorry, but it has to add up to 1. Next thing we're going to talk about is the only type of random variable we saw so far, called discrete random variable. There's another type. It's called continuous random variable. And on your exam, the teacher is going to give you a scenario and ask, is this random variable discrete or continuous? Now, you can have some that are kind of both both discrete and continuous, and in fact, that's called continuous. That will be a continuous random variable. We're not going to talk about that here, and 99% of the time, your teacher won't talk about it. A discrete random variable, it counts things in somewhat of an order, like one, two, three, four, five, it might stop and that would be finite. Or it might go on forever. It might go on forever. It can be two, four, six, eight, etc. Maybe trying to think of what you must buy in pairs. I mean, let's just say there's a law or whatever. When you buy tires for your car, you have to buy them in a pair. Just can't buy one. So how many tires did you sell today? Either two or four or six or eight, etc. Maybe shocks. You have to buy them in pairs. There are two shocks in the front, two in the back. You just can't buy one shock for the front. Let's make believe. So you can buy or sell or manufacture, well, buy or sell two or four or six or eight or ten. And if this is going on over time, you're going to keep selling them. So it goes on forever. Those are examples of discrete random variables. If you go to the candy store, you might buy one candy bar or maybe two or maybe three or maybe... 1,723 candy bars. That's one number. 
So you might buy those number of candy bars. Or you might keep buying them. Okay. Those are examples of discrete random variables. Now let's talk about continuous. Continuous random variables. You're going to go and you're going to buy gasoline for your car or possibly, you know, I don't want to say you're going to buy 3,000 gallons because you're going to say, this guy's crazy. Maybe you sell gasoline and to, to many, many gas stations and at the end of the day, you want to know how many gallons of gasoline, gall gallons of gasoline you sold. You sold. It probably will not be one gallon or two gallon or three gallon or even 1,704 gallons or 39,428,311 gallons. It probably won't be that. Let's just talk about a simple car owner. They don't purchase just one gallon or two gallons or three gallons. They can purchase 14.3124 gallons or 11.38121 gallons or 13.1114 gallons or exactly 12 gallons or 12.3178412 gallons of gasoline. These are, this is an example of a continuous random variable. Because if you wrote a number line, back to the top one, the number of tires you may buy. Today, you might buy zero tires. Or you might buy one tire. Or you might buy two tires, or three tires, or four tires, or, or maybe you're going to buy a hundred tires. Okay, the, how many tires you might buy is discrete. You can put a little interval around two. If you make it small enough, you, there's no number in that interval other than two where you can buy that number of tires. For example, well, let me just erase this, please. For example, in this interval, there is the number 2.314572. But you can't buy that number of tires. There's a number here. It's a little bit less than 1. 1.83214. You can't buy that number of tires. That is what is making this discrete. Now, of course, if around 5, I put a very big interval around five, it is around five, there are other numbers in there. But I can pick an area around five, above four, and less than six, where I can't buy number of tires in this interval other than five. I, no matter what number is in this interval, if I had to buy a number of tires in this interval, if your boss said to you, go out right now and buy me somewhere between 4.78 and 5.34 tires, I hope you would buy your boss five tires. Because here's three, and here's four, and here's five, and here's six. And 4.78, think dollars and cents, is more than four dollars, less than five. For argument's sake, it's right there. 5.34, think dollars. It's more than five, less than six. Suppose it's right there. So your boss says, buy some tires for me in between here. He's gonna buy five. You certainly aren't gonna buy 4.99 tires. I'd only, you know, I'd love to see what a .99 tire looks like. Or a .78 tire, or a .83 tire. But when it comes to the continuous, when it comes to continuous 
like the number of gallons of gasoline that you are going to buy. Now we're not talking about if it's realistic that you actually go out and buy 3 billion gallons of gasoline. We're just saying in theory what's going on. Well, the thing is, now let me pick some number seven. So you buy in gasoline. You want to know if it's continuous. Well, you, you pick the number, say seven. And you consider an interval around seven. Six and eight. So you have this number right here. It's more than six, less than seven. It's 6.72. Or you pick that number. It's between 7 and 8, 7.31. Whoops, what's going on here? Yeah, I'll put those numbers back up in a moment. So the question is, is purchasing gasoline, so the number of gallons that you can purchase, is it discrete or not? It's going to be continuous is if any interval you put around 7, in particular, small intervals around 7. Here's 7, very small interval, but I blew it up above. And there are some numbers in, between, in that interval, like 6.72 and 7.31. Can you buy that number of gallons of gasoline? Sure. You can buy 6.72 gallons of gasoline. You can purchase 7.31 gallons of gasoline. Let the random variable count the number of gallons of gasoline, excuse me, number of gallons of water that you pour on the ground with your garden hose. Let it count the number, okay, so let's write it down formally. Let x count the number of gallons of water that comes out of your garden hose. Now, is this continuous or is it discrete. Well, you know, you, you, usually you pick an integer. You, you pick, say, 8. And here's 7, and here's 9. Just ask yourself, can I pour out that number of gallons, whatever that number is, you know, 7.48. Or if you prefer more friendly numbers, 7.5. 8.5. Can you pour out that number of gallons? And the answer is absolutely. When it reaches 7.5 gallons, you shut the tap off, and on the ground is 7.5 gallons. You can do that. But now, what if I say let x count the number of garden hoses that you own? Pick 8 again, or pick any number, 8. And here's 7, and here's 9. Can you purchase more than 7 garden hoses with less than 8? I mean, you know, be reasonable. Do you picture yourself being a sane, intelligent person, walking into the garden store and say, Mr. Garden Store Owner, I would like to buy 7 and 3 quarter garden hoses. Or, I want to buy 8.7143 garden hoses. And the answer is no. That, that's silly. You don't buy a fraction of a garden hose. So, a random variable, excuse me, a discrete random variable. Once you buy one, there's a gap between that number and the next one. You can buy eight garden hoses. And then there's a gap, and then you can buy nine garden hoses. And then there's a gap, and you can buy ten garden hoses. But when it comes to continuous, 
If you buy eight gallons of gasoline, the next number you can buy, it is not nine. It can be 8.1. It can even be less than 8.1. You can buy any number of gallons of gasoline between 8 and 9. Any number. You can buy 8.314213214487. Fair enough. You'll need, you will need a really, really exact way of measuring it. But you, could, you can buy that number of gallons. We never talk, we never take into account, is it really feasible that we do that? Is it feasible for you to buy 20 billion tires? E even if you are a tire salesperson, you, you're the biggest seller of tires in the world. You know, you may say, well, yeah, 20 billion sounds right. Fine, fine, fine. Then how about 378 trillion? At some point, you may say, well, that's ridiculous. Who, who's going to buy 378 trillion tires? You may say, you know what? We don't have enough rubber in the world to produce it. We don't take that into account. We don't take into account that there's not enough land in the world to put, you know, a gazillion tires. In theory, you can buy a gazillion tires. You can buy a gazillion and a half tires. But you can sure buy a gazillion and a half gallons of gasoline. If you want to buy carpeting, you go into the coffee store and you say, give me three yards, or give me three and a half yards, or give me five and a half yards. Or... Now, I admit, most people will not go in and say, please give me 34.12873 yards of carpeting. But it can be done. Here's the carpeting rolled out. Here's the roll of carpeting. It's rolled out. Here's zero feet and one feet and eventually 34 feet and here 35 feet and here seven. If you wanted seven feet, they'd cut it or seven yards, they'd cut it right there. Well, at some point, will really be 34.12873. They cut it right here. They say, here is your carpeting. This costs this and this amount of money. They collect your money, and you go on your way, and you lay down your carpeting. But you can buy carpeting in any length, which makes if the random variable represents the length of, of the carpeting, then it's a continuous random variable. Okay, so we did a number of examples there. The next thing we're going to talk about is to find the mean for a random variable. Let x count Hmm. Something's disturbing me here. Okay, well, it, let's not talk about it that way. Toss a coin, excuse me, roll a die, roll a die. D -R -E. And the question is, is to find the average roll. Roll a die. Find the mean. Find the mean. The mean roll. The mean value. Okay, well, the formula is mean is the summation of x times p of x. When you roll a die, the results will be 1, or 2, or 3, or 4, or 5, or 6. And the probabilities, well, they're all equally likely. They're all 1 sixth. They are all 1 sixth. 
and we want the mean, which says we have to multiply x by p of x, and then add them up. Okay? So x times p of x. The reason I can write down x times p of x right there is because I have x and I have p of x. 1 times the 6, 1 6. 2 times the 6, 2 over 6. 3 times the 6, I'm going to keep it as 3 over 6 and not a half, because in the end, I want all the denominators to be 6. So when I add them up, the bottom is 6, and I add up the numerators. 4 times the 6 is 4, 6. 5 times 1, 6 is 5 over 6. 6 times the 6 is 6 over 6. And we add up the numerators, because all the denominators are 6. 1 plus 2 is 3, plus another 3 is 6 plus 4 is 10, plus 5 is 15, plus 6 is 21. Divide the top by 3, divide the bottom by 3. 7 over 2 is 3 and a half. Your average roll, mean and average are the same. Your average roll would be 3 and a half. Now, hopefully this will convince you of that. 1, 2, 3, four, five, six. It's equally likely that you get a one over a six. Well, the average of those is three and a half. One plus six is seven, divided by two to get the average, you get three and a half. The average of two and five, well, they add up to seven, divided by two, three and a half. Three and four, three and a half. Okay, the average is three and a half. Okay, let's change the game. How about we're going to have three children? Okay, and it has three children. What's the average number of boys in a family with three children? Find the mean number of boys in a family with three children please find the average number of boys if you think about it half of the kids will be boys and on average and the other half will be girls if you have three children on average be one and a half. One family will have two. Uh, one family will have one. Next door neighbor will, no, we're talking about families that just have three kids. One family will have one. The next door neighbor will have two. That average is out to one and a half. One family will have zero. The next family will have three. The average is zero and three. It's one and a half. I use the ball the possible, all the possibilities. Either you have zero, one, two, or three boys. All right. So to find the mean, the mean is x times p of x. But add them up for each different value that x can be. Well, x is the number of boys. In the family of three, those are the possible number of boys you can have. It's silly. Or not natural to say you're going to have seven boys. I mean, I can put seven down, not a problem. But its probability is going to be zero. There's absolutely no chance that if you have three children, that you're going to have seven boys. How can you have more boys than children you have? If you only have three children, you can't have seven boys. Can't have two and a half boys. Maybe on average. You'll have two and a half, but you can't have two and a half boys. Likewise, you can't have a negative number of boys. Well, let's look at what's called the sample space for three boys. You can have boy, 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 or boy, boy, girl, or boy, girl, boy, or boy, girl, girl. Or you can have girl, boy, boy, girl, boy, girl, 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 boy, or 
all three girls. There's eight outcomes no matter what. There's eight outcomes. I just listed all of them. How many of them have zero boys? Just that one. One eight. How many have one boy? Just one boy. Well, it's where you have a boy, the one boy in the first position, or the second, or the third, and nowhere else. There's three different ways of having one boy. Well, having two boys, now we're doing two boys. Having two boys mean you have one girl. Well, the chances that you have one boy is three out of eight. The chances that you have one girl is three out of eight. Because either you have a girl, the one girl in the first position, or the first girl in, in the third position, or your, your only girl in the third position, or your only girl in the second. Only girl is in position one, or position two, or position three. There's three ways. How many ways can you have three boys? Well, that means you're having no girls. And the chances of having no girls should be the same as the chances of having no boys, which we already know is one over eight. But if you want no boys, there's only one way. It's all girls. I'm afraid why I circled that earlier. I guess, oh, wait, wait, we want three boys. We want three boys. It's only this one. So now that we have x and p of x, I can multiply x and p of x like it tells me to do, and then I'll add them up. And that gives me good old mu, which is the average. Zero times an eighth is an eighth. One times three over eight is three over eight. Two times three over eight is six over eight. Three times an eighth is three over eight. Everything's over eight. If you say no, it isn't. Zero is zero over eight. Zero plus three is three. Plus six is nine. Plus three more is twelve. Divide top and bottom by four and get three halves, which is one and a half. The average number of boys that you will, oh, let me just label the heading, x times p of x. The average number of boys that you will have in a family of three is one and a half. That's if the chances of having boys and girls are equally likely. And Studies have shown that that is true. Because I was recently told that after the third child, if you have three boys, it's no longer a half that the next child will be a boy. I forget what the number is, but it's higher than a half. If you have three girls, it's a higher chance that you're going to have a girl the next time. However, in this course, and I don't mean just in this video, in any stat class you take or any probability class you take other than a very advanced one, it's a half. It's natural now to talk about the standard deviation and the variance. There are two formulas to compute the variance. Variance is sigma squared. While you add up stuff to calculate the variance. And what you add up is x times mu squared times p of x. x minus mu squared times p of x. That is, we're going to need an x minus mu heading and mu squared, x minus mu squared heading and a p of x heading. Then we multiply those two quantities together. Then we add them up. And you need to be able to see that. So how about we go back to having the three boys, excuse me, the three children again. And we want the variance for the number of boys. And we learned that either you can have one zero boys or one boy or two boys or three boys. And the probability the probability of having zero boys is one eighth, and three boys is one eighth, and three over eight 
for the other two cases. Now, let's assume that we did not calculate the mean a moment ago. So, one of the headings we're going to need is x minus mu. And then I'll square it. I already have my p of x. p of x, got it. But I'm going to need mu. So, you need to remember that mu is, well, let me know. Mu does not equal x p of x, but it's the sum of them. So, x times p of x. Is 0 times an eighth, 1 times 3 eighths, 2 times 3 over 8, 3 times an eighth. You add them up and you get 12 eighths, which is 3 halves. You add these up, you call the sum mu, get 12 over 8, which is 3 halves, which if it helps you is 1 and a half. So now we have mu. So now I'm in a position to do x minus mu. x minus mu. These are my x's, and I only have one mu. 0 minus, 0 minus 3 halves is negative 3 halves. 1 minus 3 halves is negative a half. 2 minus 3 halves, x is 2 now. 2 minus 3 halves is 1 half. X is now 3. 3 minus 3 halves is 3 halves. But I don't really need X minus mu. What I'm looking for is X minus mu squared. So now I can do that. Since I have X minus mu, now I can square it. You square that number, 9 quarters. You square that number, 1 quarter. Square that number, 1 quarter. This number, 9 quarters. Now and only now can I find x minus mu squared times p of x. This is what I'm looking for. So I multiply x minus mu times p of x. x, x minus mu squared times p of x. 9 quarters times an eighth, 9 over 32. 1 quarter times 3 over 8, 3 over 32. 1 quarter times 3 over 8, 3 over 32. The next one will be 1 over 8 times or 9 quarters times 1 over 8 is 9 over 32. And I got it. Sigma squared is the sum of these numbers. Now everything's over 32. 9, if I had the numerators, 9 plus 3 is 12, plus 3 is 15, plus 9 is 24. Turns out that 8 goes into both of these numbers, the numerator and the denominator. It goes into 24 three times. It goes into 32 four times. So that is the variance. The top formula was the variance. But remember, the standard deviation, which is denoted by sigma, is just the square root of the variance. If you have one, you have the other. The standard deviation, well, the square root of this number. If the square root of the numerator, which I do not know, divided by the square root of the denominator, which I do know. The square root of 4 I know. So there is your standard deviation, and the variance is 3 quarters. That's using the formula on the very top. So like I said from the get-go, there are two formulas that we can use. I'm going to erase most of this on the bottom. Try to remember the answers. See if I get the same ones. Because if I don't, then I'm cheating you. Uh, 
Okay. Just like in the last sections earlier, we had two ways of calculating the variance or the standard deviation. We still have two. The other formula, some people may say it's a bit easier. We only, we sum up one thing and then we take away mu squared from that. Okay, we sum up x squared times p of x. x squared times p of x. Now, want to know just a little, little algebra. x times x is x squared. So, x squared times p of x, well, x squared is x times x times, that's x squared, x times x, times p of x. Now, how you multiply three numbers is up to you. That is, I can put brackets around it. That is, I can take x and then multiply that by x p of x. And the reason I like that is I already have my x. I already have my x. And I'm in a very good position to calculate x times p of x because I have x and I have p of x. Let's just get right to it. Let's first calculate x times p of x. So 0 times an eighth is 0. 1 times 3 over 8. 2 times 3 over 8. 3 times 1 over 8. 3 over 8. That's x times p of x. Now, to get x squared p of x, I can multiply x by x p of x. I have x p of x here, and I have good old x here. So we multiply. It's 0 times 0, 1 times 3 over 8, 2 times 6 over 8, don't reduce, and 3 times 1 over 8. That's 9 over 8. And I'll show you why in a moment this is a good way of doing this. Everything's over 8. 3 plus 12 is 15, plus 9 more is 24. This is 3. So the summation of this is 3. Okay, 3. Minus mu squared. Now, of course, we're not going to do it two ways. We've we done it here two ways. But, you know, on a homework assignment or on an exam. Unless otherwise stated, you're not going to do it two different ways. That is, we don't have mu. But wait a minute. Yes, we do. Mu is the summation of x times p of x. Oh, we have that column. 3 over 8 plus 6 over 8 is 9 over 8, plus 3 more is 12 over 8, which is 3 halves. So, minus mu squared. When you square this, you get 9 quarters. Now, I would love to write this 3 with the 4 on the bottom. Just remember, 4 times 3 is 12. So 3 is 12 over 4, that is 3, minus 9 over 4, this gives you 3 over 4, which is sigma squared. You have sigma squared is 3 over 4. That is your variance. Sigma is just the square root of 3 quarters. I do not know the square root of 3, the numerator. But I do know the square root of the denominator. Square root of 4 is 2. That's your standard deviation. The same two values that we got before. Sigma squared is 3 quarters. Sigma is the square root of 3 quarters, which is square root of 3 over 2. Okay. Me, I like the other way better, but a lot of students like to do this one. 
I think I like the other way better because I remember that formula. Okay, that's going to, next thing we're going to do is expected value. Expected value. How, so you're going to, basically this is for games, this is gambling. Okay, you, somebody said, you know, how about we play this game? Toss a die. If a five comes up, if a five comes up, you win five dollars. Make it six dollars. If not a five, you lose five dollars. What is your expected value? Expected value is denoted by E. And the formula is just the average. If you add up x times p of x. And x is the random, is how much you win or lose. Remember, if you lose, it's minus 5. If you win, it's plus 6. That is, those are the x's. Plus 6, minus 5. Now, so let's make up our distribution table. Get a 5, and let this symbol represent not 5. The probability you get a 5 when you toss a die is 1 out of 6. Probability you don't get a 5 is 5 over 6. And notice 1 over 6 and, two o and 5 over 6, they add up to 1. Okay, those are the probabilities. So how much you expect to win or lose, well, it's, well, let me continue. It's the summation of x times p of x. So let's actually do the multiplication. x times p of x. 5 times the 6. Uh, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Like I said earlier, few moments ago, the X's are how much you win and lose. If you win $6, if you win $6, that means the 5 came up and the probability is 1 6. If you, and the next option or possibility is you lose $5. And that happens if you don't have a 5, so the probability is right. It's 5 out of 6. Okay, 6 times the 6 is 6 over 6. Negative 5 times 5 over 6 because I'm multiplying x by p of x. Negative 5 times 5 over 6 is negative 25 over 6. And the rule says if I take the x p of x column and I add them up, I get the expected value. And when you add these, it's negative 19 over 6 which is negative 3 and a 6. You would expect to lose a little bit more than $3 each time you play. So somebody approaches you and say, let's play this game, you, you run. Because you're going to lose a little bit more than $3 on each hand, on each toss of the die. Okay, yes, you can make a million dollars on this game, but you'd be really, really lucky. So in the long run, you will lose three and one six dollar each time you play. If you played a million times, well, you lose a little bit more than three million dollars. It's just not a fair game. This is not a fair game. Let's simplify the next problem. Your auto insurance costs 
$600 per year. And every accident, the repair for any accident, here's where it's being simplified. For every accident is $10,000. is ten thousand dollars. No matter what accident you have, ten thousand dollars is the cost. Okay? That's the simplified version. Okay, uh, the probability of an accident is one out of a hundred. Question is calculate the expected value. Calculate, I called it E a moment ago, it really should be E of X. Calculate E of X. It should say E of X. Okay, so the state doesn't demand that you have insurance. We're going to find out if it's profitable to have insurance or not. So we need to multiply X and P of X. All right. Now, either you pay $600 and the probability that either at the end of the year you lost $600 because you didn't have an accident and you paid the $600 to uh, have this coverage. The probability, well, if one out of 100 times you have an accident, well then 99 out of 100 times you did not have an accident. Now what if you do have an accident? Well that happens one out of 100 times. How much, now this is negative because you paid it. Now, how much money, you know, let's just change this. Just a couple of words, not, not the problem. Suppose life insurance costs $600. And if you die, you collect 10000 Or your family collects ten thousand. If you die, you whatever that means, you get ten thousand dollars. Okay, and the chances that you die pretty high. <laughs> the probability that you die is a hundred dollars. And the question is should you take this deal? Should you take this deal? Is this a good deal? So either you lose six hundred dollars. See, if you live, I mean, let's be reasonable. If you take your hard earned, well, I guess you want to live, but put that aside. You take your hard earned dollars, six hundred of them, and you give it to an insurance company. And at the end of the year, you didn't die. Well, you gave away $600. You got absolutely nothing for that money. You may say you got peace of mind, but let's not go there. That's not real math. Okay. Now, you may die. You may die. And how much do you get if you die? Well, everyone, well, a lot of people might say, well, you get $10,000. You, you will get, that is, you will earn $10,000. No, 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 no. You did pay six hundred. You are only getting ninety four hundred dollars. And the expected value, well, you figure out the x times p of x and then you multiply. Let's do that on the side because it's a little bit math. You know, it has math, multiplication. A negative times a positive is a negative. So we're done with their signs. 
A hundred goes into that bottom number one time and it goes into this number six times. And division by one, don't even bother doing. Six times 99 is 594. Okay. 9400 times 1 over 100, well, two zeros on the bottom, two on the top. 94 times 1 is 94. Divided by 1 is still 94. Okay, you add these up, you get negative $500. Every year that you have this policy, you are losing, it is costing you, you are losing $500. Of course, there are people who die the first year, and well, they're like, their family's like, wow, that was a really, really good investment. We invested $600, Charlie died, and now we, we ended up making $9,400. Okay, those people will say, that was a good investment. I, I'm sorry it had to do about that. Sorry about that. But if we're just talking from a money point of view and not family loss, it's a good deal. Other people, they live and it costs them $600. But in the long run, it's going to cost $500. It's not a good deal. It's not a good deal. But in reality, insurance companies, people take life insurance out when they're young, 20, 30, 40. They're going to live another 30 years. So the insurance company, if you have a $100,000 policy, they're not going to ever collect unless you live a long, long time. They're not going to collect $100,000 from you. What they're going to do is they're going to take whatever money that you give them, they're going to invest that money, and 30 years later when you, you do pass, that the, the minimal money you gave them, the few hundred dollars a year for 20, 30 years, from their investing it, it is now worth $280,000. And they're only giving you 100000 So they're making out like bandits. It's not like auto insurance where you give the company the money the first of the year and then a year later the policy is done. They didn't have any time to really invest your money. They're making their money on the fee they charge you. Suppose there is a lottery. Suppose there's a lottery and there are 500 different numbers to choose from. And of course, if you pick the right number, you win. The probability that you win, well, it's one out of 500. Now, suppose the game cost one dollar and the payout the payout is a million dollars at the say a thousand dollars they pay off the payoff is a thousand dollars that is if you win they give you a thousand dollars So what's the expected value? How much do you expect to win each time you play in the long run? How much do you expect to lose each time you play? For example, if in the real lotteries, the big lotteries, that they're multi-million dollar lotteries, if you actually had a positive expectation, you, you were expected to win $2. Well, you're going to have to play a long, 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 long time to, to win. Well, some people win the first time, but the bottom line is, though, you still have a positive expect value, expected value. Okay, what is it in this case? What are the values, what are the payoff values? Well, what can X be? Well, if you lose, you pay a dollar. You lose. And if you win one out of 500 times, then I take it you lost or lose, 499 times out of 500. Now, if you win, that probability is 1 in 500. 
The question is, how much do you win? Okay, here's where students make mistakes. They'll say, come on, you're telling us what we win. We win a thousand dollars. Uh-uh. You spent a dollar. Okay, if you walk into the grocery store or your lottery store and you win, how much money do you end up walking out with? How much extra money do you walk out with? I mean, let's do the math. You have $50 when you go into the store. You give a dollar, so now you have $49. And then you win $1,000. So you leave the store with $1,049. How much extra do you have? Well, you have the $1,049 in your right hand. Take away $50. Take away $50. And what's, because that's what you walked in with. That's what you came in with. And what's in that hand that remains is how much you won. You only win 999. Okay, you have to keep that in account. You don't win what they tell you you win. Okay, imagine you play a game and you win a million dollars and you're all excited. I won a million dollars. I won a million dollars. But wait a minute. It costs a million dollars, example, a play. You got to pay a million dollars for that lottery ticket and you win. You're not going to tell anyone, oh, you know, I won the lottery because you didn't win a penny. Okay, so we need to calculate x times p of x. We multiply these two numbers, negative 499 over 500. Multiply those numbers, you get 999 over 500. You add them up. Since they're both over 500, we keep 500. You add the numerators, negative 499 plus 999. This is 500. Five hundred over five hundred is one. This is a game that you should play. Okay, because every time you play, you will win a dollar. On average, you give the person a dollar for the ticket, and they basically give you a ticket, and you'll win two dollars. That is, you'll win a dollar. Okay, you play the game a thousand times you would probably win a thousand dollars. This is your expected value. You expect to win a dollar. This is a game that you play all the time. However, I do want to point out one thing. If this is a lottery game, lottery game is one game. Maybe it's for a week. People come in from Monday to Sunday and they buy a ticket and then Sunday night they tell you the winning number. And then Monday morning comes along, it is a new game. Okay, so if the game's only once a week, it, you could only average a $1 win per week. I'd have to think about if you bought five tickets during the week, if you would expect to win $5. That, that's a harder problem. This finishes up the section on random variables, expected values. Okay, have fun with it. Don't do too much gambling. And if you do, make sure that the odds are in your favor. And in my opinion, if the odds are in your favor, it is not gambling.